so I had the great pleasure of working very closely with Steve Sawyer during the translation uh, and editing of the English version of uh, Foucault's Wrongdoing Truth Telling. And, um, and, uh, and that was a great experience. It was really, um, for me, uh, incredibly, uh, an incredible growing experience, actually, to work with Steve on, on, on the translation. Uh, to, or for Steve to work on it, for me to see how Steve was working on it, and it really came out well. Um, and those are the 1981 lectures, the Louvain lectures, uh, wrongdoing truth telling. Uh, Steve Sawyer is the chair of the history department at the American University uh, of Paris. Uh, he's also the director of a new center there, the Center for Critical Democracy Studies. Um, and uh, he has a lot of other important responsibilities. He's the associate editor of Anal. Uh, the uh, histo History and Social Science uh, Journal uh, in France, uh, Anal Histoire Sciences Sociales. He's the editor in chief of the Tocqueville Review and the author of the forthcoming book, Demos Assembled French Liberalism and the International Origins of the Modern State, 1850 to 1880. And so he's going to be talking to us today about. Uh, the, question, the larger question of Foucault and the state, um, you, you, you may be familiar with the piece he published called Foucault and the State in the Tokyo Review, um, but he's going to be uh, talking about the larger project today. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Um, well, thank you, Bernard, and thank you for this invitation. It's always uh, a tremendous pleasure to work with you, and the Madifel Diapre was a was really a fantastic experience. So this, um, this is part of a, a larger project. Um, what, I, what was pre-circulated is essentially the chapter after what I will talk about today. Um, and just to give you just a brief word of history on the project, it grew out of sort of two things that I was doing at the same time. The first was the book that uh, Bernard just mentioned, The Day Was Assembled on the State After 1848. Uh, sort of thinking about the state after 1848 and what that revolution did to thinking about the relationship between democracy and, and, and the state. And the other one was I was working on the wrongdoing truth-telling with Bernard. And I started digging back into Foucault's courses from the 70s and 80s as a, in preparation for that translation. And uh, up to that point, I had largely shared the sense that pervaded much Foucault's scholarship as well as the theoretical and historical scholarship that's been inspired by it, which is that, to sum up um, one very useful perspective, but one that I ultimately disagreed with, that Foucault is pushing us beyond the state. And when I began looking at the courses in the context of a kind of post-1848 context uh, that I have in my other work, I realized that Foucault thought, especially in the wake, wake of 1968, his critique of Marxism, his critique of liberalism, and his turn towards governmentality did not amount to a disinterest in the state. Uh, indeed, um, his claim that we must cut off the king's head as a call uh, it was certainly, I suggested, not a call to turn away from the state entirely. And in fact, considering the full extent of his comments on the state, uh, that, that analysis ultimately seems very problematic. So, um, <coughs> Indeed, there are all kinds of indications that Foucault was not necessarily abandoning, interested in abandoning the question of the state. During one interview, uh, during the period that sort of followed Soviet Union, and, and so this will be, these comments are mostly after the Soviet Union. There's a, I have a previous chapter that talks about uh, his early Kurdish de France courses. Um, but during one interview, he said, I have no intention of diminishing the importance or efficacy of the state. On many other occasions, he insisted that he was specifically interested in the state. For example, he described his 1978 lecture at the Collège de France as saying, this year I am giving a course on the formation of the state. A few years later, he reiterated this position. He said, for centuries, the state has been one of the most remarkable and formidable forms of human government. But he was not, uh, but if he was not interested in entirely ignoring the problem, he did provide a deeply revised notion of the state, drawing it out of the center of the story of power. He revealed its permeability and responsiveness to other sites, like individual subjectivity, family, civil society, asylums, schools, and multiple other body sites like bodies and practices. He refused 
to posit the state as a universal concept or thing with essential properties. From his perspective, one could not determine the fundamental nature of a polity by defining its state as obviously red or blue, weak or strong, centralized or decentralized. So in this project, I attempt to revisit the question of the state in a way that is largely inspired by Foucault. I do so by arguing that his approach to the state is original to the extent that it integrates the deep ambivalence towards the state that has characterized pluralist theories since the beginning of the 20th century, as well as other society-centered approaches, while at the same time allowing for a compatious conception of how the state responds to a broader context of power relations. Instead of tossing out the state in its entirety, the notion of the state that we draw out of Foucault's work cuts diagonally across neo-Marxist, pluralist, and Weberian lines by incorporating the ideas that there are multiple sites of power and uh, a, uh, a powerful place for coercion. In other words, as we begin to look for a means of thinking about the state that does not reduce it to a mere tool of dominant social interest, that does not enlist it as one power among many, or, that def or define it through its autonomy, we begin to walk on a terrain that Foucault at least uh, gestured towards um, in this period, even if he did not uh, invest it entirely. So, by the second half of the 1970s, a sea change was taking place in studies of the state across the social sciences in Europe and the United States that would gain steam in the 1980s. The publication of a series of works by Pierre Bienbaum, Charles Tilly, Theda Scotchpole, Pierre Bourdieu, Pierre Zonvalon, and Michael Mann, to name but some of the most well-known, from, from a number of disciplines, including history, sociology, and political science, all shared the common ambition to radically reconceptualize the state in our social sciences. All of these approaches shared a general critique of the dominance of the Marxist and liberal interpretations of the state. <coughs> but if Foucault was part of a larger trend, with the relative exception of Pierre Rosenvalon, who I will return to briefly at the end of the paper, the general response among these authors to the critique of the liberal Marxist approach to the state was to turn to Max Weber's sociology. Charles Tilly famously defined the state as war making, state making, all um, and extraction, uh, protection and extraction, he said all of which depend on the state's tendency to monopolize the concentrated means of coercion. Beta Scutchpole at her famous bringing the state back in project with a very uh, strong engagement with Weber and Otto Hintz, which is always sort of a... Um, and then in their Sociologie de l'État, Pierre Bienbaum and Bertrand Badi also favored a Weberian sociology. From this perspective, Michael Mann and Pierre Bourdieu are both very interesting cases. I won't go into that, but both of them present a kind of amended Weberianism. Um, uh, and in many ways, their uh, <coughs> amendments nod towards uh, some of the arguments that Foucault was making either intentionally or not. But if Weber was at the center of a wide-ranging attempt to bring the state back in, <coughs> France also witnessed a brewing critique of Weber's approach to power and the state, especially in the field of political anthropology. This field shared a general critique of Marxism as well as structuralism, but one might say that instead of turning to the study of the state, it turned against it. That is to cite Pierre Clastre, famous society, now famous society against the state, uh, which was no doubt, no doubt one of the most influential among these works. While Calastre famously turned his back on the inevitable Weberian coupling of political society and state coercion, he did not at the same time reinvest the terrain of the state per se. Sociologies, histories, and anthropologies that owed too much to Weber in his view assumed that power required violence and therefore required a state. Class, however, took a very different view. There were no societies without power, in his view. However, power could exist in society without some form of state coercion. He therefore drew the conclusion, I quote, societies cannot be divided into two groups, societies with power and societies without power. <coughs> uh, and he continued, since all societies had power, 
The proper distinction, he argued, is between those societies in which power is manifested through coercion and those that are non-coercive, that is, societies that have states and those that don't. To this extent, Klaas' critique of Weber, he really couches this as a critique of Weber in the opening to that, uh, to that volume. Um, this critique of Weber and the sociology of power that it championed shared a fundamental similarity with the work of Foucault. It is perhaps for this reason that they both turn to vivid descriptions of torture, um, Foucault's famous opening in To Discipline and Punish, and Klaas' depiction in The Right and Torture, <coughs> in his Torture and Primitive Societies appeared uh, within two years of each other. Um, and they both turn to torture to present their critiques of modern liberal conceptions of power. Working within this constellation, which could be created then, if we so, so set this up, as a reinvestment of Weber on the state on the one hand, as a way of getting beyond the liberal and Marxist positions, uh, and a profound critique of the notions that, uh, of power that Weberian social, sociology implied on the other, I'd like to say Foucault actually navigated something in between these, these two. In one sense, Foucault's position was much closer to that of Klaasche than the neo-Weberianism proposed by Birnbaum and later Bourdieu. Of course, he too largely set aside the Marxist and the kind of liberal notion of the night watchman state, just as he insisted that power was present in all social relations. And yet he <coughs> refused to throw out the state entirely. In fact, in the years following Discipline and Punish, he cultivated a renewed interrogation of the concept of the concept that continued a tremendous skepticism around the question of the state, um, but did not dismiss it as one important means of organizing modern power. So while Klaaschka insisted that all societies had power, but situated the key shift in the emergence of the state between primitive and civilized societies, Foucault marginalized the state by showing that even in societies with states, the relationship between the state and power could shift over time, which is something that classical really doesn't allow for. In other words, Foucault too embraced the idea that all societies were permeated with power, but he did not establish a predetermined relationship between those societies with the state and those without. In short, by marginalizing the state, he gave it a history, something that Klaasla could not do, right? Because Klaasla sets up this entire sort of discussion where you have, you can't have societies without a state and then you have societies with a state. Once you have societies with a state, it's sort of the whole, the whole logic of it follows. And Foucault is, um, by marginalizing the state, is much more interested in how the relationship between various modes of coercion and power uh, change over time. <coughs> this was no doubt in part because Foucault was more attentive to how the epical shifts taking place in his present could inform us about how states had functioned in the past. Um, his interest, for example, in neoliberalism, and, uh, and I don't want to go into to that sort of uh, recent debate, but uh, this, his interest in neoliberalism at the same time that he was revisiting the question of the state, in one sense, does during this period present us with a paradox. It was precisely at this moment when one might have thought that Foucault had definitively set the, si set the question of the state aside and precisely at the moment that he had begun to explore other modes of deploying power, like neoliberalism, that he returned to a questioning of inter and interrogating the state as a critical concept. As he argued, I quote, for centuries the state has been one of the most remarkable and formidable forms of human government. So the paradox is why, when the Althusserian hold on the state apparatus <coughs> that he'd been arguing against in the first couple of years of the college, um, had largely dissipated when a political anthropology that was thinking against the state was gaining steam, and even he was showing a great deal of interest in areas that were explicitly hostile or disregarded the state, why in that context did he return to it? This paradox has remained somewhat hidden within Foucault's scholarship and within larger considerations of the history and French theory of the state, and therefore has been part of a broader disregard for what Foucault has to contribute to our histories and sociologies of the state as they emerged in this period. Foucault inspired arguments for thinking beyond the state and claims on, this, on the limits of the state succeeded in largely evacuating Foucault from the discussion. This is not to say that Foucault wanted to establish the state as anything like the power, and it is certainly not to argue that Foucault proposed something that we could call a theory of the state. 
Nonetheless, even in his attempt to define the state as one rationality of power among many, the state remains an important feature of Foucault's investigations, as perhaps it should have ours. In short, Foucault returned to the state to ask the question of how it articulates to wider sets and strategies of power relations. Such an approach may be of great use amidst the persistent critiques of the state in the name of civil society and social movements, which have left us with too few potential resources for understanding how we might critically articulate power in the state um, without simply dismissing it. It is true that many of Foucault's interlocutors, even at the time, had difficulty coming to grips with Foucault's perspective on the state. In fact, the courses that followed, especially security, territory, and population, the birth of biopolitics, as well as many of the interviews he gave during the period, the organization of states became, once again, a primary concern, especially in the context of his thinking about the distribution and organization of power relations in this context. He insisted that he hoped to follow the same genealogical method that he had already outlined previously, as he explained. He simply wanted to give a few fragmentary indications on something that sits midway between the state as a form of political organization and its mechanisms, that is the type of rationality that is put into place in the exercise of the power of the state." End quote. By piecing together fragments of state power, he avoided a holistic vision of the state as some generalizable subject and presenting it as a form of power organization that was situated among other rationalities of power. The state fit into this larger constellation as a means of formalizing power relations, or what he referred to in an interview in 1977 as a mode of codification. I quote, I would argue that the state is a codification of the multiple power relations that allow it to function. The state then operates as a specific and formal coalescence of power relations that extend far beyond it. The state is no longer perceived as a discrete or autonomous set of institutions or individuals, uh, but it's a process of formalization within social relations. Foucault provided another term for understanding this process when he suggested, uh, he made reference to the fonctionnement étatique de la société, or what we might translate as the state function of society, the state function within society. Together, these ideas point toward a key feature of Foucault's engagement with the question of the state during this period. That is, widely distributed forms of power relations <laughs> could be joined into any number of codifications or functions. However, in the early modern and modern West, in particular, the state emerged as one of the most important among them. There were then a whole series of ways that they could be organized, um, and the state emerged as one specific way of doing so. He says, I try to show and analyze the relationship that exists between an ensemble of techniques and forms of power, political forms like the state, and social forms. In this approach, the state is not <coughs> only the body or structure that formalizes and organizes power relations, taking the state out of the center of a history of power relations, even in the context of early modern Europe, on a, um, on a number of occasions, Foucault highlighted that at least since the Renaissance, there were many other bodies that did this. Of course, the church, family, guild, and many others. They coordinated and organized power relations in ways that both complemented and threatened the specific rationality of state power. However, even amidst his attempts to relativize this place of the state within various ways of deploying and articulating power, Foucault insisted that there were peculiarities to the rationality of power within a specific organization. The codification of power relations specific to the modern Western state, it would seem, was not only built on the pastoral powers of the church, but also differentiated the state from other rationalities. He said, the state has as its function to constitute the global envelope, a body of global control, principle of regulation, and to a certain extent to distribute all the relations of power in a given social context. Now, I understand Foucault here uh, to be arguing about the rationality of the state's organization of power relations as being somehow specifically general. Okay? In other words, the state is obviously not, in some sense, naturally general, or in any way the essence of social generality. Generality is the capacity of the state in a specific context um, 
that comes to the context that he is that he is describing here. In this context, the state function of society, as Foucault would have it, is characterized by its capacity to be operational at the scale of society as a whole within a wider, a more widely dispersed set of power relations. Such globality means that this particular rationality requires special attention, even if it is essential that it only be understood as one technique of power. So how did this globality operate? It necessarily depends, he argues, on the multiple power relations that intersect with and surround the state. As Foucault argued in 1977, in terms of its generality, abstraction, violence, the structure of the state could never hold all individuals as it does, continuously and quietly, if it were not rooted in and did not use all the little individual tactics that enter each one of us as part of a broader <coughs> kind of strategy. I take this to mean that the generality then is a specific aspect of state rationality to the extent that it codifies a series of power relations as either local and individual or general. The ability to make claims and deploy, deploy power as a function of its generality then becomes one of its specific aspects. This does not mean, of course, that the state merely grows out of other forms of power and becomes then general, that it somehow englobes them and then rises up. Um, but it does require that the state to articulate, in order to articulate with other relations of power, um, will one of the techniques that it will use is categorize them as we might say local. It will categorize other forms of power relations as local. He says, and here I quote, without going to the point of saying that the power of the state is derived from other forms of power, it is the very least founded upon them. They are what allows the state to exist as a generality. There was, of course, a strong ambiguity in this position. The state appears at once to be one rationality among many, and the rationality that may organize itself at the highest level of abstraction. And indeed, it would <coughs> seem that in the wake of discipline and punish, there was deep confusion over the place of the state in its work. And there are a series of, of interviews where people are like, what are you, what are you doing? You, do you care about the state or don't you? you know, what's, what's going on here? Um, and uh, one, one of the better, one of the more interesting responses that he gives to this is at a round table with a series of, of, of historians, um, including Maurice Aguilon, Arlette Farge, Jacques Rovelle, and many others. And he, he sort of responds, <coughs> and, he's, and he's, he's, you can tell he's kind of getting uh, excited. He says, you know, people ask me, what, what do you make of the state? What theory do you describe to it? You neglect its role, object some. You see it everywhere, claim others. Uh, and you imagine that it is capable of controlling the quotidian existence of all individuals. And he said, this is perhaps because my problem is not that of constructing something new or validating something that already exists. Perhaps because my problem, says Foucault, is not to propose a principle of global analysis of society at all. My general theme is not society. It is the discourse of truth and falsity. And he goes on with this. This response is particularly important for thinking about Foucault's return to the state during this period. As he suggests here, he was not interested in challenging a theory of the state from the position of society any more than he was interested in its institutional capacity. Indeed, the very division between the state and society, or even civil society, was, he insisted, a technology of governance. A key aspect of the <coughs> specific rationality of state power as it emerged in the modern period instead of any kind of national, natural distinction. He goes on and on, but uh, there, are, there are numerous places where he says this, but he essentially says, my hypothesis is that the opposition between the state and civil society is just not permanent. It's just a non-starter. Uh, this refusal to divide the state and society was part of the broader critique of liberalism that he crafts during this period, in part of his discussions with, um, with Pierre Zonvalo and others, um, and in particular, the capitalism utopique. Um, but it also sharply distinguished him from the work of others like Plastre, okay, which, uh, which, is, which is significant for trying to understand this kind of nebulous of post-68 thinking about the state. Instead, he established the central idea that the opposition between state and society um, was not so much a given as it was part of a broader rationality of governance, obviously, as that famously pushed in two directions um, toward individuality and totalization. Summarizing this position in his explanation of the birth of biopolitics, he wrote, 
rather than making the distinction between the state and civil society a political and historical universal that may be used to interrogate all concrete systems, we can try to see in it a form of schematization which is proper to a specific technology of government. According to Foucault's conception, then, the modern state emerges a specific way of conceiving the political and the social, and then providing an effective mode of organization of power um, between them. As his response above suggests, the one discussing verity and falsity, Foucault then was not so much concerned with understanding society as with the question of how it is that society or politics or the state might become a position from which one might make claims on the verity and falsity of a given domain. Um, and therefore sort of harness the weapon of truth. I mean, that in, in one sense, there's this whole sort of theme running through this period starting about 78, which you can see a little bit earlier, but where the question is really about um, <coughs> the state as a mode of telling the truth. How, how is it that we can start to make claims on society or uh, by, claiming to, um, by claiming the truth. And he's, um, truth uh, as weapon is a specific reference to the lectures on truth-telling and wrongdoing that, that Bernard mentioned earlier, uh, where he opens with a quotation from Du Maisil that some of you may have seen, in which he suggests that truth is one of the oldest weapons of mankind. Um, now that particular uh, volume is focused on penal law, um, uh, but it does remain one of his most extended and elaborate treatments of what he refers to as the discours vrai faux, and what he later referred to as veridiction, the, the process of establishing a, a position of verifiability, a position from which one may speak the truth and thereby exert power in relations more effectively. I, I'm sort of insisting on this because if you've had a chance to look at Bourdieu's courses, Sur um, he has this whole, he opens with this whole kind of diatribe about how you can't think outside the state. And, and, you're sort of, sort of. and I think that in many ways Foucault is offering um, a, a very different way of, of posing that same problem from the perspective of, of, of truth and, and uh, truth and falsity. Um, so when uh, Foucault invokes the question of whether or not he's interested in the state, and he suggests that more than state or society, he's actually interested in the question of how is it that a certain place becomes a key site for elaborating truth claims on society, politics, and the individual. The social or the state, then, is not something <coughs> one can simply examine. One cannot make truth claims about the state from the position of the social or even civil society to provide a stable foundation for critiquing the state. Rather, they become relative positions from which one is able to make truth claims within a larger field. Foucault's attempt to break down the state-society divide in favor of a discourse on verity and falsity meant that the discussions on the crisis of the welfare state that increasingly appeared on the horizon in the early 1980s um, in those discussions, Foucault refuses to, take it, to establish that opposition between crisis of the welfare state and you know, the sort of push towards civil society on the other. Um, and he, he starts to think about it more in terms of this question of, of sort of where we can start to make truth claims. And in an interview on the crisis of the welfare state in 1983, Foucault specifically addressed this problem, operationalizing his refusal to establish a natural distinction between state and civil society. He applied the notion uh, to the welfare state, arguing against the two dominant positions uh, here, you know, for political context of the Union de Gauche and the Deuxième Gauche, best represented by Hocard and figures like Pierre de Lennon. He insisted that taking the side of the strong state or civil society led both led to an impasse. And he suggests this, it's, it's actually, uh, um, he says, it's le pro he says, ce problème relève de l'empirisme. So it's a problem of sort of empirical analysis. It's not a problem of somehow creating an opposition between state and civil society. Instead, um, he called for what he argued to be a decisional distance, thinking about this in terms of a distance décisionnaire. Elaborating this position, he argued, I quote, in other words, it is a question of evaluating an optimal distance between the decision, 
that is taken and the individual that is concerned, such that the latter has his or her proper say and the decision, and this decision is intelligible, while at the same time adapting to his or her situation without going through an inextricable number of rules. For Foucault in this instance, it was not so much who made the decision in any absolute sense as the distance between the individual, the group, or institution that made the decision and those that were impacted by it. It was a question of the legibility of decision more than whether or not it was situated here or there. This approach merits attention for its emphasis on decision. Foucault time and again insisted that any study of the state needed to evacuate the larger question of sovereignty. He specifically stated that it was necessary to invert the Hobbesian paradigm and start with the local manifestations of resistance and even civil war instead of the coherent and unified head of a state. But what is striking is that this does not apparently mean that there is no room for the decision. There was decision even without sovereignty, but it was rooted in a question of proximity and legibility instead of legitimacy and domination. Indeed, the paradigm of security that Foucault began to elaborate in this period suggested that an increasing number of decisions would necessarily be taken by the state. Security, he insisted, was not so much a rationality of sovereignty as a rationality and technique of state power defined by its ability to intervene at any one moment for the security of the individuals that comprise the state. As a rationality that both individualized and totalized power, the state provided security for the individual in order to preserve its sort of ability to make truth claims as a whole. But such a codification of power necessarily meant that realms within which the state could intervene, as well as when and how such intervention was possible, were entirely undetermined. The state that guarantees security, he explained, is a state that is obliged to intervene in all cases where the flow of daily life is perforated by singular and exceptional events. In other words, the obligation to intervene required decisional capacity to intervene in a context of exception. The exception, however, became quotidian instead of some sort of ultimate moment of intensity. At the same time, he also refuses any pluralist critique of sovereignty that would have sort of evacuated the question of decision. Because rationalities of state power in a context of security could not be understood through a natural opposition between some sort of norm and exception any more than they depended on an a priori distinction between the social and the political. Foucault then did not erect the rationality or the decisional capacity of the modern security state as either infringing upon or being supported by the norm. If norms were essential to the creation of disciplinary power, the security state could in some cases operate according to other logics, other techniques, other rationalities. The state was a power regime in which the capacity to make a decision, perceived or justice or not, that is rooted in truth or falsity, depended on what he referred to as an optimal distance. For Foucault, this meant that the state would necessarily become increasingly flexible as the demands of the rationality of security made themselves felt. And I quote here, it is certain, he argued, that the movement toward the development of states is not in their increasing rigidification, but to the contrary, in their suppleness, in their possibility of advancing and retreating, in their elasticity, as dangerous and potentially damaging as it was then, the state was not, in other words, on its way out. To the contrary, no matter how marginal it was, the state remained a nexus for codifying the power relations and making decisions that seemed to characterize our late political modernity. So in conclusion, just a few last words. Um, <coughs> quote, to quote Foucault in The Birth of Biopolitics, 1977, he said, 1979, he says, what does doing without a theory of the state mean, he asked. In some ways, this question in itself captures the importance of Foucault's thinking on and around the state in the post-1968 period. But when considered in this context, it also challenges some of the current 
analyses of work on the state during this period. And um, here I quote Sam Moyne, whose, whose work on, on Clastre, I, I thought was, I, it's, it's a fantastic article, but I, I disagree with one thing. He says here, the effect of May 1968 on French intellectual life pointed overwhelmingly in the direction of a post-centralized, non-hierarchical, pluralistic, and above all, participatory vision of politics, one in many ways never successful in discovering institutional mechanisms for its own realization. Well, what I think a sort of careful look at Foucault suggests is that if some elements of this claim are certainly accurate, that is, there is a general emphasis on plurality, uh, we, it is a sort of post-centralization perspective, and there is a turn away from specific focus on institutions, the larger suggestion that French thinkers in this period turned their backs entirely on the state needs to be reconsidered. In fact, I think it would be possible to make a fundamentally different claim. That this period in France, especially among those who did not embrace Weber's, the neo weberian paradigm, generated some of the most fruitful perspectives for reconsidering and critiquing the state in our liberal democratic contexts. While there were many thinkers that turned their backs on the state, the turn away from Marxism and structuralism in this period generated an equally set, an important set of complex, if ambiguous, reflections on how the state might articulate with other modes of power. Of course, one road that reflection on the state took was, was the neo weberianism on the one side and the sort of um, anti-statism of Clastre on the other. Um, but it is worth considering those highly original thinkers from this period who have continued to have an important influence on our reconceptualization of the state, and in some cases, uh, trying to rethink how it might articulate with liberalism and democracy, some of the same questions that Foucault was asking in, the in 79 and 80. Not the least of which were those figures like Pierre Rosan Vallon, with whom he was in regular discussion in 79 and 1980. We'll be here next week in your seminar. While thinkers such as Rosan Vallon and also figures like Claude Lefort and others hardly capture the entirety of thinking on the state of their generation, very far from it, they all did engage with Foucault's work during this period, <coughs> and in some cases directly. And though none of them defend the, define their position on the state in response to Foucault's position per se, perhaps in part because there was no clear Foucaultian position, this group did engage with him on this terrain. These post-1968 intellectuals did not turn their back on the state any more than they embraced it as a comprehensive response to the challenges of contemporary political life. In short, for all of their differences with Foucault, they responded to the same question, what does doing without a theory of the state mean? Thank you. Great, so um, I thought we would open it up to discussion and um, take uh, questions and, uh, and comments. Um, maybe I'll, I'll just start by asking something about <coughs> this focus on decisions and decisionism, um, which is interesting, um, although I, I, um, I'm wondering where you find that in the texts of the period, in Foucault's texts. Mm -hmm. um, because I mean, so I mean, when I think about the state and decisions. I think of um, I think of the seventy two text and the and the uh, repression of the Nupier rebellion mm -hmm. and those kind of state like decisions mm -hmm. that Chancelier Seguier was taking, Richelieu, etc. But as we move forward from that period, it seems to me that there's less of that in the analysis of the state and more of a kind of conduct or governing of behaviors. Um, mm -hmm. And so so I just kind of, that, that seemed important yeah. to your analysis yeah. and very original. But I'm wondering where, where does it come from exactly? Well, I, I think, um, first of all, I think we are in a very different space than we are in the 72 <laughs> lectures. I think that's, that's clear. Um, and in fact, one of the ways that I think we can see how far his thinking on some of these questions has come is by looking at 
at the state in particular because, you know, I mean, as uh, we've already talked about this, but in, in the in those first lectures, I mean, you could you, you, know, you could call them, of course, if you if they had been called the birth of the state, mm -hmm. and so they found nobody would have been, oh, that's weird because that's essentially what they're about. Mm -hmm. um, but what I found amazing is in 78, he says, he's giving an interview, he says, I'm giving a course this year on the formation of the state, right? And he's referring to the security territory population, which is not surprising in one sense, but that's not at all, right? I mean, you know, it's not all about it. So I think, so I think we, we do have, a, and, and I think you're right, he is, he is moving in a very different direction. What I find interesting and is that, and here I was, here I was citing um, sort of interviews, uh, talks, uh, papers one, uh, that he's giving. Um, I have to go back and sort of look at uh, some of the other materials. This is new uh, things that I've found. But what I think, in one sense, that happens is he, he doesn't, so he's, he's interested when he starts talking about decision and exception. Obviously, he had, you know, he obviously cannot go the Hobbesian sort of ultimately Schmidtian route. And at the same time, he's forced to recognize that the state makes decisions all the time, that it's doing this. He cannot attribute that to sovereignty. That's not an option. So where does he go? Well, what he ends up doing is sort of quotidianizing the exception and suggesting and sort of deflating this idea that, that Schmidt had, had, I'm not saying he's directly responding to Schmidt, but Schmidt is, is obviously the person sort of hanging the you know, 800 pound gorilla. And Schmidt is obviously going to argue that you have this level of intensity and that the ultimate is right, so sits at the end. Foucault kind of flattens that out because he's just taken sovereignty out of the, out of the picture. And so then the state has to make these decisions all the time and it's going to have to be more and more elastic and it's going to have to do it as a sort of imperative of the technology of security. Um, as, as it emerges in this, in this state context. So what I'm trying to get at is that he's, he's, he's not throwing out, in one sense, the baby with the bad boys. not saying because I'm not talking about sovereignty, because I'm not talking about um, uh, equality or all these sorts of themes that were so central to thinking about decisionism in, in that book. I don't have to throw away the fact that I see states making decisions and sometimes they have to do it and there is no logic in the sense that it's not like, oh, well, when we are, when we are in exceptional circumstances, I will have to make, it, you know, the state will make decisions. It's not about that. Exception all the time. Singular. That's, that's the imperative of security as a technology of state power in our contemporary societies. Okay, Jer Jeremy Kessler. Thanks so much, Tim. Uh, both in your lecture and in, and in the, the paper in the Tech Field Review uh, that you wrote, um, I, I, very, I was very struck by uh, the, the, the move you identify, which seems right uh, in the late 70s, putting aside the, the question of decision, but the idea of trying to associate what happens if we think of the state as just a particular form of rationality, mm -hmm. in particular, the feminine form of rationality. Um, I think that's very helpful, uh, but it, I, I'm not sure it is helpful in precisely the way uh, in which you are hoping it is helpful. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that, it, it, to me, it suggests that what may be at stake for Foucault in the late 70s is not so much state vel or non, not so much, you know, engaging with Quastra, engaging with the neo barbarians as, as you sort of flag early in your essay and in your talk, um, as his engaging with the Mar with Marxists. And the problem for Foucault seems to be not so much, today we think the state is the big issue, mm -hmm. right? And we're interested in recovering Europe, yeah. and recovering the Foucaultian theory of the state. But it seems like the fight he's more directly engaged in is over the question of what power means. Mm -hmm. What is power? Uh, and how that relates back to his very early uh, comments on ideology critique, right, which is how he begins the Collège de France lecture series. Yes. And, and to me, the rejection of ideology critique, the evacuation of power as having a particular class basis, and then this move uh, in the late 70s to identify the state as a form of rationality mm -hmm. seems to me to be connected. And, yeah. and, and just as an example, the reason why, I, so as an example of what I mean and why I feel like the state might be the wrong thing to focus on here mm. as what's distinctive and what is uh, 
being debated. Yeah. Um, is, you know, so you, in your paper, quote uh, uh, Fuances from State Government mm -hmm. Socialism uh, as saying, uh, because of Foucault's focus on, the mi on micro power, uh, he doesn't have anything to tell us about the state. And yeah. quote, in the, your quote ends, Foucault's indisputable merits are therefore to be found in another region. Um, but in the context of that part of state power and socialism, uh, what Poulancis is saying is not that Foucault denigrates the centrality of the state. That's part of what his problem is with Foucault and Deleuze. But it's particularly that they denigrate uh, class struggle mm -hmm. as, the as like the ontological basis of power. Yeah. And if you go on to the next page, everything Poulancis then says precisely mirrors the account of the state that you just gave us of Foucault. Yeah. Uh, so he writes, um, and I'll end here, but um, uh, the primacy of struggles over the state goes beyond the sphere of the relations of production since there can be no question of an economic structure that found struggles in turn. Uh, and he just on and on and on just says what is primary is are these struggles that are going on beneath the state, are these yeah. relations that are going on beneath the state, and all of these micro relations of power that are going on beneath the state, and then he says they, they come to constitute the state. Yeah. So they have, he has exactly the same syntax as Foucault. He's just saying, I'm willing to name power and associate it with a particular exactly. ontology. Exactly. Foucault, and what he's taking to t Foucault to task for is not a kind of an ignorance of the state, but is a refusal to say what is this matrix of power from which the state is emerging and then redetermining. Yeah. No, I think, I mean, that's, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, I, 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 you're, you're right on. I guess I would, where, where I would, what I would say is, Palantis is, what he does still want to do is put the state sort of at the head of this. But as right? the Foucault with the idea well, of I global think, rationality. I, no, no, so what Foucault wants to argue is that the state uses globality as a technology. It is, it is inherent in the way the state in since basically the 16th century. Uh, 17th century. It, in, it's inherent in how the state has constructed its claims of verity. Um, but it's not some sort of real result of the agonism that's taking place on the ground. It is that the state, what the state will do, the, the technology of state power, what it will do is determine that you, it will determine the locality of those conflicts and the globality of the state conflicts. Um, and so globality is not essentially what the state is. It is, it is part of its technology. And so what I think the difference is that Foucault just, he, he does in what it's, it's, it is, it's, it's, it's what's radical about it is he does sort of marginalize the state almost completely in order to say, that's the only way that we can understand how it, how it tries to operate and insert itself in these other sets of power relations. Poulantis, I understand, to be saying, you have all these other, but that power has a name, as you said, right? That, that he, he's willing to give it a center. But the power's name is not the state. The power's name are precisely, precisely non-state class forces. And what's so interesting about this the critique of Foucault not having a theory of the state is it perfectly mirrors, right, that going back to Weber, the classic critique of Marx, which is Marxism does not have a theory of the state because Marxism reduces the state to a, to a kind of fluid yeah. system of social and economic processes. And, and so, uh, so, so, so there's something funny about, about and so I agree, but once is trying to deal with that critique yeah. uh, and trying to give some account of the state, but it's odd to kind of pose these, these Marxist thinkers that, folks, that Foucault is engaging with as sort of status as against Foucault's anti-statism, when they're, oh, you know, when sure, they're responding course. precisely to the problem Oh, I see, I see what you're Foucault. saying. Absolutely, absolutely. They're all but seen as not having a theory of the state. Okay, so this is what, so what I would suggest is that Foucault is in one sense trying to, yeah, no, I, th I think that's absolutely right. Um, I'm not saying that Palantis, I think Palantis has a theory of where 
of, of the state in the sense that he can explain to you <coughs> why the state is there, where, where it's coming from, and why it is able to mm -hmm. do what it does. Um, but what I'm particularly interested in that quotation is, is the fact that he's saying, you know, Foucault can't really tell us anything about the state, and that's really what we need to know about. And we really need to understand this sort of what's, what's actually happening in the state. And what I'm trying to say is Foucault has a lot to tell us about the state. Right. That, I, that's what, I, I'll yeah. give up, but I would just say I think like read in context he's saying that what we need to know about is the relationship between whatever this thing is that might be the state uh, and uh, the huge field of other non-state yeah. things that are going on so you're saying which is very similar to yeah. what in my understanding no, I don't have a problem with that. Foucault and, saying and it yeah. seems to me that the debate is not Fouances is very state-centric, whereas Foucault is marginalizing the state. But it seems to me the, 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 the source of direct tension is what is their account of not what is not, you know what is not the state, what is what is what is what is constructing the state. Yeah. Uh, and there, it seems the, the issue for Foucaultians <coughs> or Foucaultian theory of the state is what's that? Yeah. Because Fouances has an account, not which is not the state. Which are, which are classes. Yeah, no, I, I think I agree with yeah. everything you've just said. I don't, I don't, I don't. What I don't see is quite how that uh, differs from what I would. But I, but I, I think that's, I think that's right on. And I also think that, um, to some extent, frankly, many of the neo-Marxist sort of the, the, the intense revisionism, neo-Marxist revisionism of the state that takes place in the 80s and 90s is also some of the most original thinking about the state, and extremely helpful, I mean, especially in political geography in the 90s. And, and as you said, they're getting from Foucault. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that, and, and I th but I think that Poulos is, <coughs> he's gesturing in that direction, but I guess, yeah, I mean, I don't want to repeat myself, but yeah. It's but very I helpful. think in this conversation, though, and, and, what I, and maybe what I didn't hear enough in, the, in your presentation, yeah. and is relevant to this conversation, though, is the way in which Foucault historicizes the state mm -hmm. and, and places it as a temporal um, form of, of veridiction uh, during the history of forms of governmentality, of forms in which we govern others, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And I mean, I think that's important here because it ends up that I mean, once you once you place the state as a historical moment in the larger field of ways in which we govern ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And once it fits there in that period, which begins with you know raison d'état somewhere around the mm -hmm. 16th century and eclipses, then you are left no longer with a theory of the state that applies that we can talk about with application today, for instance, mm -hmm. um, or, or with, a, yeah, with a theoretical framework that we could use mm -hmm. to help understand the state mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. right? Because it's this historicized moment. And, 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 and somehow um, that, that is a great break from the other thinkers. Um, it allows us instead to see how we govern ourselves differently today, maybe in a neoliberal period, mm -hmm. uh, which is why, which is why to a certain extent I think he comes back to the state yeah. in 78, 79, because he has finally figured out how it fits in his thinking of relations of power and how we govern each other. Yeah. Right? But I mean, that does mean that he, it's a completely... It, it, it seems as if it's almost an orthogonal theory of the state in relationship to other thinkers in that way. No? I mean, of course, it's that's one of the bridges to the mainstream. I mean, because the move to historical sociologies of the state is a mainstream development of the 70s. Mm -hmm. It's the Giddens move, it's the Michael yep. Mann move. Yep. They're all making precisely this move. Right? And, and so it's away from perhaps sort of abstract political theorizing. Um, but all of those people are immersed <laughs> in the project and of constructing genealogies. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Um, uh, and, and so I would have thought that's one of the bridges through which Foucault then passes into a kind of mainstream, yeah. uh, disaggregated, 
view of the power and the state's relationship to that by the late 1980s. Um, which they also draw from Weber. You know, from, okay. from the politics of vocation, which is odd move because, to my mind, that is a fundamental misreading of Weber. So Weber, oh, really? Weber acquires a history to which he's not entitled on the grounds of his own methodology. They 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 remake Weber as a genealogical, dynamically thinking, so which Weber himself is a would I think have strongly rejected. Yeah. Um, but, but there is a, an Anglophone Weber reading of the 80s which has exactly that kind of quality, whereas yeah. somebody like Habermas is making mm. use of a very different, radically ahistorical Weber in mm. his 70s move against history. That's, that's mm. so, yeah. but, but exactly as Bernard's saying, I think that is the common ground on which Foucault then shifts into an appropriation which could be Bob Jessup's you know, late Marxism, yep. or it could be a, a, a Giddens or somebody like that. No, I think um, that's exactly right. Yeah. But and a lot of the but complexity that, but that creates a problem. I mean, but that creates a problem, though, then, because it no longer becomes, I mean, because because it, it doesn't necessarily have much purchase on the present, on 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 the state in its present. In, or in, the, in, the, in, in its present context. I, I'm not sure why you describe that as a problem. It certainly has, that is one possible implication. Mm -hmm. Assuming that you think there's some historical rupture. Right, right, right. right. Which isn't necessarily an assumption you have to make. But, so Michael Mann will just ride all the way forwards to the mm -hmm. Iraq war in a sort of yeah. hodgepodge kind of continuity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's absolutely. I think that I think that historical social, sociological moment is is a set, is exactly what emerges at this time. No, I, I completely agree with what you just said. Yes, I mean I, I would add I would add in because I really like to move. I love this the talk. I like much better than the than the okay. essay. So and I find this move that you make to repositioning the axis. You know, in, insisting on the centrality of the question of, of truth and truth telling mm. as the organizing principle and not yeah. the, the axis civil society state. Sure. Which, which is because he's, he's moving both things to Exactly. Right? Yeah. But then I would add into the mix, and this is a, 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 a refrain that Jeremy is, is familiar with, that, that I think he has a Marxism problem because he has a Derrida problem. Because hmm. I think the fundamental tussle all the way back to the history of madness is how you write a non davidian account. How you write one which is resilient, however, in the face of Derrida's critique. And your obvious friends in that battle would be Marxism, of, yeah. various, of its more refined kind. And that is why this is this primary struggle. And you see those early essays tussling. Because if, he's not, if he is going to construct a history of truth, which is an effect of various types of power. Outside yeah. the text. How, outside the text, exactly. Out, and he does this so brutally in those early lectures. He insists, this is what I'm going to do, outside the text, it will be rooted in power, it will be contextualized. How do you avoid being, how do you avoid falling into the clutches of Marxism? So, he, so, so he's, his problem is double, right? Um, and and, and uh, that, 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 I, I see that running through all of these lectures again and again, field after field, it's the same problem. And so again, the Marxists are struggling with, as Jeremy is insisting, a non-state centered account. But they have the ontology of forces of production and class conflict to fall back on, right? Yeah. What's he going to do? Yeah. Um, so essentially, what, what would a state, what, how would you talk about the state without materialism? I mean, how, how, do, how do you avoid how either do you the materialist or the idealistic account the, yeah. of the state? How do you produce a non solipsistic philosophical account? Because what he above all doesn't want to produce is a philosophical account of truth, right? One that is locked into that moment which he diagnoses in the first lecture course, where truth closes in on itself, yeah. which is essentially what he accuses of Derrida of doing in his replique exactly. to Derrida, which comes out in the early 70s in yep. the new edition, right? He's, he's devastated, so he's shocked by Derrida, I think, early, and he's coming back. And so the question is how do you produce a non, radically non-philosophical account uh, of, the, of the history of truth uh, without, without, without becoming uh, material. In fact, yeah. the early moves are, well, I'll find all these moments of struggle, you know, the aborted land war that is the foundation of the classical Greek moment. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. That, for me, is like the... the no, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's an outstanding uh, sort of way of cutting cutting through what he's, and sort of the problem he's, he's posing. Um, and I mean, I guess, I mean, there are a couple of things. I mean, I, 
I guess I'd say, I think Derrida confronts that problem as well in the end with the, with the, when he comes back to sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I think that's, I think, you know, the Derrida problem is a problem for Derrida too. So that, that might be, uh, uh, and, but I do, and, and the fact that Derrida does come back to that question uh, around sovereignty, and I think, I think is important, right? Because that's, that is sort of one of the things that cuts through. The materials don't have to deal with sovereignty because it's all sovereign. There's just various modes of power. And, uh, and then on the other hand, the sort of, uh, sort of Derrida sort of way of, 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 of discussing the problem of power without sovereignty is another way of sort of getting outside of that. So where does Foucault sit there? Um, I mean, obviously, uh, you, you, you know, you said essentially, you were, you were essentially saying the, the, the ideas that were coming to, I mean, I would say that, that the question of his attempt to push beyond some sort of materialism through a historical, I mean, that's how he says he's going to do it, is, this, is, is by doing this, this, this history, right? It's going to, it's not going to have a substance, it's going to be sort of, as he runs, it will be collapsing behind him in one sense. Um, I guess that's what, that's part of why I'm so, I mean, there isn't a lot to go on. I shouldn't overstate this, and this is one concern I have about it. But I think this question of decisions is kind of interesting mm -hmm. because he is, in one sense, leaving room for places where you could kind of come down and, and, and elaborate solutions. And then there, and he's talking about this sort of singular, exceptional, one after the other, and it will just be sort of this, this process of establishing some form of, or employing this logic or these technologies one after the other without ever having to give it some substance, right? That's what will define it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that there's, I think there's something. This is the last question again. Where, which are the texts that we need to read to find these references? So these were all, all, almost all of these particular, this, this was coming from, mostly from Birth of Biopolitics, D, C, 3, and 4, and Security Territory Populations. So that's where I see him essentially yes. doing most of this. Uh, well, in fact, that's where all of these, uh, yeah, all of these citations came from. And, and a little bit from, um, well, but yeah. Uh, but, but I think, that, I think that's, a, that's actually an incredibly useful way of, uh, a very helpful way of thinking about, uh, about the problem that he's, that he's coming into. And perhaps what's driving him back to the, to the state. Uh, he, he, he wants to have a non-materialist account of the state, so he can't do labor. But I, 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 we, just, we can go back. Yeah, no, I, mean, I, I, I don't want to. Uh, no, 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 go ahead. So, so I think that's exactly right. I, mean, I think, I think like what you think to diagnose is exactly what happens uh, in his thought, but it just seems to me uh, to be a real problem. Uh, and given sort of the work that you've done with Bill uh, and Jim and Bernard and others sort of kind of move, trying to move away, not just from Weber, but from Schmidt and Agamben to yeah. some extent. I mean, this, th this idea that where Foucault ends up is this vision of a state that is not a just kind of philosophical, psychical thing, the state that can intervene, that can make these decisions, um, is, 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 it seems to me to be a very disturbing place to end up if we don't have uh, really a kind of more complexified account of the state, we seem to be heading towards a, a sort of monomaniacal account of the state. And I would just, I finally found the quote, but what's okay. interesting is this is precisely what uh, Pouancis predicts in his conversation with Foucault in 79. So Pouancis writes, contrary to all status conceptions, ranging from the burningly topical ones back to Weber and his vision of institutions as the original site the primary field of the constitution of power relations. It is struggles which make up the primary field of power relations and which invariably have primacy over the state. This is true not simply of economic struggles, but of the totality of struggles, political and ideological included. To be sure, the relations of production still play the determining role, but the primacy of struggles over the state goes beyond the sphere of the relations of production since there can be no question of an economic structure that found struggles in its turn. Quite simply, these relations of production are already relations of struggle and power. So he's trying to respond to yeah, the, the, the deterministic absolutely. charge. Yeah. Now, this determining role is the essential and most general factor in the very existence of struggles and the primacy of the totality of struggles 
over the state. To reject this as the foundation of struggle is to reject not only the determining role of the economic, but the primacy of any kind of struggle over the state. Although it may seem that the tyranny of the economic would thereby be discarded, one is inevitably left with the devouring omnipotence of the power state and capitalists. So what Poulances is saying is, I understand the worries about Weber and being too state focused, and I understand the worries about, uh, about uh, economic determinism. But if you have an account of power struggle, if you want an account of power struggles that are primary to the state, they need to be grounded in something like the relations of production, or you will be left with sort of an empty set. You will be left with a sort of mysterious, inexplicable field of power, and that will lead you back to the devouring omnipotence of the power state. And I can't help but feel that this idea that what Foucault ends up talking about, and there seems to be some resistance to say that what he is ends up talking about, is the state as this sort of kind of sublime sort of moment of decision is, preci you know, is precisely... No, 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 that's definitely order. not what I'm trying to argue, though, that it's sublime, that it's the ultimate moment. That's certainly I'm not... Being yeah, yeah, I mean, what I would say, I, I think, I, I would, it's funny, because I would agree with, like, every line that he's, you know, that he's yeah. about to say, uh, until you get to the point that he basically wants to put it back into society. It goes back to struggle, it goes back to social struggle. And I think Foucault, whether or not he succeeds, and frankly, that's just not. Mm -hmm. But I just, Foucault just doesn't want to put it there. So what is he doing? Where is he trying to right. send us? He's trying to say, look, I can't, t it's, it's not economic, and Plants say it's not economic, it's not institutions, Plants say, but it's ultimately struggle, and if you don't come to terms with that, it will be power. Well, Foucault does that same move, but he gets there with, he, he's not, he just refuses to accept that somehow we could set up social struggle as a place from which I could I could see power. Mm. That's just not going to happen. Social struggle is a place from which I can establish a truth claim on the state. And the state is a, is a place where I can make a truth or falsity claim on a social struggle. But I'm not, I, I do not then have a vision. And Poulant says, I, do, I, think I have a hard time, I mean, I think we can get there much later in some of the neo like, mm -hmm. really, I think, I think post on is there to some extent. Mm -hmm. But at this stage, we're not there yet with completely relativizing for all sort of, you know, subject position from which Poulantz is writing. And Foucault, I, I am not sure he's, and I'm fairly sure he doesn't ever quite solve this problem, but he's certainly, that's where he's sending us. I think that's, you know, that's where we have to just try. It's already just trying to figure out what he's trying to do and why he keeps going back to it without having to establish a basis. And so the decision there is important precisely because it is not sublime, precisely because it is so quotidian and banal and un... It manages, however, to be quotidian without it, and yet unique. So repeated exactly. and yet endlessly unique. Because the problem is normally the association of the unique, so some sort of drama. Yeah. Whereas quotidian, quotidian sounds like a big N, like whereupon it immediately loses its loses exceptional quality and just must be subsumed within some generalizing knowledge again. But you're saying that it, well, I, I, solution is a kind of yeah, kind of, exception. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A kind of, exactly, the kind of idea, in fact, every time I walk to work, I, 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 I could fall. I could, okay. I, I, I could skin my knee and need yeah. the state to give me health care. You know, I could, the security state will, that there, that it's this kind of just, that in fact, and, and you know, there's a sort of long history of this, but that, that kind of thinking of the quotidian is this just every instance is actually an exceptional singular moment. All right. Marvelous. Well, join me okay. in thanking Steve Thank Sawyer you. for a terrific presentation.